Namaskar, I'm Harpreet Kaur and I welcome you all to our special live and interactive session. Well, you're watching this webinar series, Listening to Learn, Yani Sune or CK. This is the 87th session or edition of this webinar series where we bring you different topics and of course, eminent personalities who throw light on some relevant issues and make us, you know, easily understandable. So, I think it is very important to understand the concept very easy so that you know we can also simplify things and apply them in our lives. So today's session is uh, one such session where we are going to talk about butterfly effects, trophic cascades, natural and anthropogenic, yani titli prabha, poshi sopan prakritik or man bhavi. So, in this session, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to get in touch with us because this session is live and interactive. So, we have different mediums for you. Right now, you are watching this session on our e with your channels 9, 10, 11, and 12. This session will be uploaded on our YouTube channel NCERT Official in a short while from now. And if you have any queries that uh, you know, you would like to ask, you can always write an email to us with your feedback, suggestions and everything under the sun. So, our email ID is dth.class9 at ciet.nic.in and phone number you can note kar sakte hai, jo hai 8800 This information is flashing on your screen. And we would like to tell you this too, chahenge, कि ये प्रोग्राम ये सेशन आप तक हम लेकर आते हैं बाय डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एजुकेशन इन साइंस एंड मैथमेटिक्स एनसीईआरटी एंड टुडे फॉर दिस अमेजिंग एंड कलरफुल टॉपिक आई वुड से वी हैव इनवाइटेड टू इंपॉर्टेंट गेस्ट इन द स्टूडियो वेल आई एम इंट्रोड्यूसिंग यू टू द मैन बिहाइंड दिस एंटायर इनिशिएटिव हु विल टेक दिस जर्नी फॉरवर्ड we are joined by Dr. Gagan Gupta from DESM NCERT sir namaskar Namaste, welcome to the Hathi session ji. जी और टॉपिक एक बार फिर आप सबको बता देती हूँ इट इज बटरफ्लाई इफेक्ट्स ट्रॉफिक कैसकेट्स नेचुरल एंड एंथ्रोपोजेनिक नाउ सर मैं आपसे रिक्वेस्ट करूंगी कि प्लीज इस जर्नी को थोड़ा हम आगे बढ़ाते हैं जी थैंक यू हरप्रीत जी और दोस्तों नमस्कार और दिल्ली का मौसम बहुत सुहाना हो चला है हम लोग बहुत अच्छे एक एटमोसफियर में हैं मेरे साथ आज मेरे सीनियर मेरे टीचर प्रोफेसर टी आर राव मेरे साथ हैं आपका स्वागत है प्रोफेसर राव हमारे स्टूडियो में और दोस्तों आपको मालूम है कि ये सीरीज हमने अगस्त 2021 में सी एस आई आर इंडिया के कोलाबोरेशन और नेशनल ह्यूमन राइट कमीशन इंडिया के कोलाबोरेशन में हमने शुरू की थी और आज हम अपने सतासीवें पड़ाव में हैं इन तीन वर्षों में लगभग तीन वर्षों में हमने विज्ञान तकनीकी सोसाइटी से जुड़े हुए कई सारे विषयों पर बात की है चाहे वो हेल्थ के विषय हों चाहे वो इंडियाज प्लानिट्री मिशन हो चाहे वो इंडियाज न्यूक्लियर प्रोग्राम्स हों चाहे वो इंटरस्टेलर प्रोग्राम्स हों हमने हेल्थ के जुड़े हुए विषयों पर बहुत सारी बात की साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी के विषय में बात की यदा कदा हम थोड़े से बाहर भी निकले इन अपने साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी से हमने किस तरह से पढ़ा जाए किस तरह से सुना जाए आर्ट ऑफ लिसनिंग और उन सब के टॉपिक्स के बारे में बात की हमने आर्ट लर्निंग ऑफ पोइम्स के बारे में बात की कि पोइम से कैसे हम इन्फॉर्मेशन निकालें हमारा अगला एपिसोड भी जो आज के बाद होने वाला है कुछ ऐसे ही विषय पर है इसी बीच में हमने एंटरप्रेन्योरशिप पर भी बात की दोस्तों आपको याद होगा कि मुंबई डिब्बा वाले हमारे साथ पवन अग्रवाल हमारे साथ स्टूडियो में थे अलीना आलम अभी हाल ही में अलीना आलम जिसने कि देश में सारे विकलांग बच्चों के साथ स्पेशली एबल्ड लोगों के साथ मिट्टी कैफे चेन सीरीज चलाई है वो भी हमारे साथ थी आगे आने वाले दिनों में एंटरप्रेन्योर से जुड़े हुए कुछ और लोग भी हमारे साथ होंगे आज मेरे साथ प्रोफेसर टी आर राव हैं जो कि दिल्ली यूनिवर्सिटी से हैं और वो बात करेंगे आज हमारे पास कुछ इकोलॉजी से जुड़ी हुई चीज़ें इकोलॉजिकल साइंस से जुड़ी हुई चीज़ें कुछ बात करेंगे हम बहुत दिनों से इस विषय पर का बात करने की कोशिश कर रहे थे आपके सुझाव हमारे पास आए थे कि कुछ इकोलॉजी के जुड़े हुए विषयों पर हम बात करें हम माफ़ी चाहते हैं कि हमें आपके सुझाव को लेने में थोड़ी सी देर हुई लेकिन आज हम पूरा कर पा रहे हैं आप अपने सुझावों को हमें भेजते रहिए लगातार भेजते रहिए हमें आपके सारे सुझावों को समावेशन करने का पूरा प्रयास करेंगे और चाहे किसी भी तरह के प्रश्न हों चाहे किसी भी तरह आप हमारे पुराने सारे एपिसोड्स 86 एपिसोड्स अब तक हो चुके हैं आज सतासी माह है हमारे एन के वेबसाइट पर जाएं एन और उसके आप इवेंट सेक्शन में जाएं 
इवेंट सेक्शन में आपको सारे के सारे एपिसोड्स वहाँ पर देखने को मिलेंगे दोस्तों ये सारे एपिसोड्स बहुत यूनिक एपिसोड्स हैं जो जिसमें कि बहुत जटिल समस्याओं को बहुत जटिल प्रश्नों को हमने कोशिश की है कि बहुत ही आसान भाषा में और स्कूली शिक्षा के हिसाब से हम उनको उतार सकें किसी भी लेमेन के हिसाब से किसी भी जनरल पर्सन जनरल व्यक्ति के हिसाब से सामान्य व्यक्ति के बोध के हिसाब से हम उन विषयों को ला सकें आज फिर से हम एक ऐसे ही विषय पर हैं जैसा कि मेरी दोस्त हरप्रीत ने बताया कि आज हम एंथ्रोपोलॉजी सॉरी एकोलॉजी पर बात करेंगे बटरफ्लाई इफेक्ट्स पर बात करेंगे बटरफ्लाई इफेक्ट्स क्या है बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग स्टोरी है आ, मैं इस बारे में ज़्यादा नहीं बोलूँगा मेरे साथ प्रोफेसर राव हैं वो बटरफ्लाई इफेक्ट सुनने में नाम बड़ा बहुत ही आकर्षक लगता है बहुत ही इंटरेक्टिव लगता है कि बटरफ्लाई इफेक्ट्स क्या है क्या ये वाकई में मधुमक्खियों से जुड़ा हुआ है या कुछ तितलियों से जुड़ा हुआ है या क्या उसके कुछ कॉन्सिक्वेंसेज हैं किस तरह से वो वर्ड आया है इन सब चर्चाओं पर आज मेरे साथ मेरे सीनियर मेरे टीचर प्रोफेसर राव बात करेंगे आज मेरा दिन कम है बात करने का प्रोफेसर राव का ज़्यादा है तो इससे पहले कि मैं प्रोफेसर राव को पास माइक दूं और उनका सेशन शुरू करूं मैं आपका मुलाकात कराना चाहूँगा प्रोफेसर राव से प्रोफेसर राव ए फेमस इकोलॉजिस्ट एंड ए ग्रेट टीचर ऑप्टेंट हिज मास्टर्स डिग्री फ्रॉम द आंध्रा यूनिवर्सिटी एंड द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ हवाई हिट इट इज एम एस सी फ्राम आंध्रा यूनिवर्सिटी एंड एम एस फ्राम हवाई यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ हवाई डॉप्टेंड हिज डॉक्टरल डिग्री फ्राम द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कैलिफोर्निया यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स फ्राम नाइनटीन सेवेंटी एट टू नाइनटीन टू थाउजेंड फोर नाइनटीन सेवेंटी एट टू टू थाउजेंड फोर आई बैग योर पार्डन प्रोफेसर राव वॉज विद द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ दिल्ली एज डायरेक्टर ऑफ स्कूल ऑफ एनवायरमेंटल स्टडीज एंड एल्सो विद द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जूलॉजी एट यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ दिल्ली ड्यूरिंग नाइनटीन सेवेंटी फोर टू नाइनटीन सेवेंटी सेवन डॉक्टर राव हैज़ बीन ए फैकल्टी एट द हवाई इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ मेरीन बायोलॉजी यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ हवाई यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स प्रोफेसर राव हैज ऑल्सो बीन विद द इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ साइंस एजुकेशन एंड रिसर्च पॉपुलरली कॉल्ड आइजर एट बहरामपुर एंड मोहाली बोथ हीज ऑल्सो बीन एसोसिएटेड विद द नेशनल ताइवान ओशियन यूनिवर्सिटी किलोंग ताइवान एंड द इंटरनेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इकोलॉजी साउ कार्लो ब्राजील Dr Rao has also received the Canadian government postdoctoral fellowship during 1972 to 1974 and the East West Center scholarship of the United States federal government from 1965 to 1967 I was born in 1965 sir <laughs> so that senior so old I am yes sir so, so no so how young you are <laughs> still during his magnificent career as a teacher professor rao has taught many courses on population ecology ecosystem ecology aquaculture ecotoxicology animal behavior environmental science and yes of course biostatistics research interests of professor rao include ecology and behavior of zooplankton and fish professor rao has more than 65 research articles in various international international journals professor rao has also guided 10 phd and 12 mphil theses he has also been a member of the editorial board of several international journals uh, aquaculture and aquatic ecology are examples dr rao was conferred the teacher of the year award in 2015 by the indian national science academy insa new delhi so welcome once again professor rao to our thank show you. thank you friends in the today's program Uh, professor rao will be using several illustrations several figures these illustrations either belong to professor rao or have been taken from the open sources so you are free to use those sources for any academic purpose so professor rao it's all yours we thank professor uh, university of delhi professor rao once again for having collaborated with uh, ncert for this series thank you sir Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gupta and uh, Ms. Harpreet uh, Kaur, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I am so happy and grateful that uh, Dr. Gupta has invited me to give a lecture here, and uh, which is always a pleasure to me because uh, I always wanted to um, interact with uh, students uh, from the high school stage, because this is the age when. um they could be influenced or instigated uh, to choose various kinds of disciplines 
as you see uh, most of the time many of the students now they have a uh, a single objective of simply going for a BTEC in uh, chem computer sciences and then go on to US for higher studies and making lots of money. But this ecology that I am going to talk about, this is of course uh, the topic is ecological and I am an ecologist. Uh, so, uh, with this brief introduction we will just get going, but however, before um, going into the main topic, I would like to put you all in a uh, frame of mind, ecological frame of mind. I would like to condition you, I would like to prime you into ecology, so that you can appreciate this topic better. So, uh, I quickly I will go through about 6 or 7 slides to show the various facets of ecology. Uh, it is the heart of environmental studies. We talk about a lot of environment these days trying to solve so many problems and if you want to understand the, the background behind this you have to have sufficient knowledge of ecology, how nature operates. It is like uh, something like uh, what is physics to engineering, ecology is to environmental sciences. Both found foundation the basic background upon which you attend to various problems. If you look at the um, say various levels of biological organization, you see you can arrange them in this way, going from the big biosphere all the way down to macro molecules which includes of course, DNA, nucleic acids and all that. Here comes the molecular biology and uh, cell biology, anatomy and physiology. Now, look at this ecology, it encompasses so many levels of organization, that is the big scope of ecology. We ecologists explore a wide range of uh, ecosystems ranging from wildlife sanctuaries, deserts, even tree holes. These are the holes formed by breaking of a branch into which water accumulates during rainy season and that itself forms a small miniature ecosystem which will yield very, very fascinating results. Your gut, a termite's gut or any animal's gut is a whole complex ecosystem of microbes and it they many of them follow simple ecological principles that you see operating on land. Okay. I will show you some examples now. What is so fascinating about ecology? it interacts with so many other disciplines of biology. See how many. So, it is a discipline that can interact productively efficiently to answer some questions in various aspects of biology. For instance, uh, there is um, behavioral genetics, uh, physiological ecology, biochemical ecology, you would be surprised that there is even a molecular ecology field and uh, so you will be also surprised to know that uh, economics departments they talk about environmental economics which is a very very important field. What are the kinds of questions that uh, ecologists ask? So, there are two types of questions in nature that we could ask if, when you are curious how and why types. Let us take an example a bird or the, a sparrow or a bulbul that is sitting near the window and when you are trying to wake up it makes nice sounds, uh, it almost sounds like a nice song and you can ask these questions when your curiosity is aroused. How does a bird sing or you can also ask why does a bird sing? Two different types of questions. When you are asking how does a bird sing, you are interested in knowing the mechanism of sound production, the mechanism of composition of a song, bird song that goes into biophysics and other things. But we ask why does a bird sing? You are asking about the significance of this song, why is this bird singing? What does it signify in the life of this animal? Is it singing just because it is very happy in a happy mood? or is it doing as a, a warning to his friends that same some enemy is nearby or is it a courtship song 
to attract the mates. So, here are some examples of how ecologists go about doing things in the field. This is David, uh, David Rejnik collecting small fish called guppies in the streams of Trinidad in the West Indies. He has been doing this for last 17 years to study the evolutionary ecology of these species. 17 consecutive years without break. Here is an adventurous lady, Nalini Nadakarni, uh, who is not like the ordinary day to day ecologist. She is interested in studying the canopy of the trees. Canopy is the widespread, like you see in, uh, say, on a banyan tree, and so. And in rainforests, some of the trees are very tall and not easily accessible to reach the top. So, uh, if you want to reach the top and you have to climb up the tree and reach the top to reach the canopy. So, she uses rock climbing equipment to climb these trees, tall trees goes on the top canopy and sometimes it could be so thick that you could just stay there and uh, do your research. Here is um, a marine ecologist, so why is it going so fast? <laughs> Here is a marine ecologist studying behavior uh, of turtles in situ wearing a scuba diving. Can you imagine anything so more exciting than to be underwater and watch all these creatures in situ live? Here is a doctoral student conducting field experiments on the desert plants. Remember this in California desert during daytime temperatures could go as high as 50 degrees and he she or he puts up a tent there, lives there for a few days to collect all his or her observations. And uh, the surroundings are, uh, there are rattlesnakes which are dangerous and really poisonous animals with all these things. You can do evolutionary ecology on agar plates. This guy has been doing. Um, and um, Richard Linsky, he has been studying evolutionary phenomena and ecological phenomena using microbes like E. coli uh, cultured in the laboratory and look at his statistics, mind boggling. Okay. So, so that is sort of uh, uh, my effort to uh, sort of put you in an ecological frame of mind and now I hope you are ready to appreciate the topic I am going to discuss now. Butterfly effects. What on earth is a butterfly effect? Sounds like a very strange name for an effect. Somebody said, I do not know who, but said that the flutter of a butterfly wing in a Brazilian forest can set off a tornado in Texas. All right. So, where is the uh, a Brazilian forest? and then thousands and thousands of miles away at, at Texas. Just a flutter and a tornado. Uh, so, um, this of course, is a metaphor to describe a small change in one part of the system can have large effects elsewhere. That is a butterfly effect. When you do something very small without knowing the consequences, you never know how this, this small thing will go and affect. Uh, larger effects are there in the whole system. So, uh, this uh, is a, a small quotation to show how we are all connected in nature. Uh, more elegantly put by uh, Chief Seattle, who is an American uh, Indian chief, Seattle, and uh, the city of Seattle is named after him, and he said in a nice poem and note what he says, all things are bound together, all things connect, we are all connected, we are all connected, you are connected, I am connected to the bacteria, earthworms, uh, fish, uh, birds, um, uh, whales and even chimpanzees, right. Not only through uh, uh, the genes and DNA, but through the emotional connect in the nature. Um, so, uh, now we will discuss one case uh, of uh, this kind of a effect, uh, butterfly effect, uh, where 
it's completely going too fast. Just no, all right. my, my controller. It's in your <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, I will, I'll start with this one. It's kelp. Many of you may not be familiar with this because it's a marine. I don't know how many of you have been to the seashore. Uh, but in many places you see that they, these brown algae are very small. But in certain areas of the world um, where the temperatures are very cool, coastal areas, uh, subtropical areas like California, some areas of Alaska, these kelp grow to enormous lengths some 50, 60 feet. They are attached to the bottom of the sea, the bed and they grow tall floating and uh, they grow in such profusion they form complex network and resulting something like a forest. Okay. So, this is a kelp forest ecosystem just like our um, rain forest ecosystem. You can see that um, kelp forest, it harbors a uh, wide Sorry, could this be controlled, please? Just it's moving too fast. Oh, it should I be under my control. It's in your control, uh, but, uh, okay. I don't know why it's. They're uh, not doing anything. Uh, okay. I don't know why it's doing it. Okay. So. Okay. I'm sorry about that. No uh, okay. So um, this is a very very important ecosystem in the coastal areas because it harbors a diversity of invertebrates and vertebrates like fish. Uh, okay, so now um, we introduce some uh, actors in this drama. This is the kelp, of course, I have seen shown you. And now let us say there is this global warming. All right, we, we heard a lot about global warming. Everybody talks about global warming these days. Okay, uh, ranging from political netas to common man on the streets is everything they attribute to global warming, whether it's floods, drought, everything. Uh, it is going too fast. Okay. So, we ask the question uh, why is it and where is this connection between these two? Is there a connection? Okay. Now, let us see what happens. There, these are sea urchins. I do not know if uh, any of you have seen live, but uh, they are very interesting creatures full of spines. They belong to the phylum Echinodermata. Okay. They are on the um, in the kelp ecosystem, they grow at the bottom of the sea on the seabed. Sometimes they grow in such huge abundance that they cover the hole like a spiny uh, mat. What are they doing there? They are simply consuming the kelp. Now, another actor in this is a sea otter. Sea otter is a mammal, marine mammal, funny looking. It also lives. It should stay on this. Uh, and it should stay like it. Okay. Uh, so, this is a, um, uh, the mammal, and what does it do in the kelp ecosystem? It feeds on the sea urchins. Okay. So, sea urchins feed on the kelp, and uh, otter feed on the sea urchins. You can now see that. Um, a young uh, sea otter with his breakfast on his belly ready. Okay. So, now what you have in this kelp ecosystem is a simple three trophic level food chain. Okay. Autotrophs, kelp, herbivores, the sea urchins and uh, primary carnivore the otter. Okay. Now, beyond the shores in the offshore waters there are these killer whales very dreaded mammal, very vicious killers. They occur in pods of many uh, individuals. They are uh, feeding on sea lions, be, themselves very big animals and harbor seals. These are their two staple diets. Okay. So, now uh, those two uh, that uh, arca lives in offshore waters feeding on these two. Okay. So, now this is a small ecosystem by itself where arca is the predator and it feeds on these two animals. Okay. Now, uh, suddenly in the late 1900s something happened that caused alarm to the scientists. 
During that period, many of the coastal kelp forest areas started either dwindling or even disappearing in some coastal waters. What happened? During that period when these uh, kelp forests were disappearing, orca which used to be normally in the offshore waters started moving into the inshore waters entering into the kelp ecosystem. Why? Well, the, this is speculation and hypothesis, but scientists believe that they gradually increasing ocean temperatures, okay, the warmer water temperatures waters now drove the two food species, okay, sea lions and harbor seals away from that region into some other areas further down where their own foods were available. And the net result was Arca is simply left without its food sources in the offshore region. Okay. So, what does it do? In search of food, it starts entering into the kelp ecosystem. Okay. That is how it came into the kelp ecosystem. It was its food was missing in the offshore waters, it had no choice, started looking for this food and enters this. So, that is how. Now, what used to be a three trophic level system in the kelp forest has become now a four trophic level. And now situation changes. The top one affects the level below and the one that affects the level, level below and keeps going down much like a um, cascade. This is the type of cascade you see in mountainous regions, Himalayas, western Ghats, and all those things and typically from one level keeps tumbling down come to the next level and it sort of affects the lower levels. That is why these are called trophic cascades. Now, let us see what happened. Now, you have a four trophic level system and how does it lead to the loss of uh, kelp forests? Arca populations increase. Okay that leads to a decrease in otter for obvious reasons because the orca feeds on the otters. The decrease in otter population leads to increase in sea urchins, right? because the sea urchins now are saved from the predation by otters, they are relieved from this predation pressure. So, they flourish, they flourish so much that they start grazing away all the kelp and that is how the kelp disappeared in many areas that is because the orca enters the system and suddenly starts the trophic cascade. Okay. That is the fascinating story of how introduction of a, a new predator into a system ultimately has cascading effects on the all the other lower trophic levels. All right. okay. Now, I will take another example where the cascade is apparently caused by anthropogenic factors, obviously humans. Where did this happen? In Yellowstone National Park in the US, one of the most well known, uh, most uh, toured attraction in the US, uh, one of the largest and most earliest national park in the world. What is special about this? Uh, the top predator here is grey wolf. It looks like a, a large sized dog or a, uh, our own wolves, but it is a very vicious animal and very often they move in packs. That is a winter scene in uh, Yellowstone Park. This is elk on which they feed. This is like related to deer. Uh, you can see that male in uh, Lostrian Park, which is really attractive and big antlers. This, uh, um, those of you who are uh, familiar or remember your childhood days when you were celebrating Christmas and looking for Santa Claus to bring your gifts, on what vehicles did you come? Ah, reindeer, yes, remember Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. So, this reindeer is the same as the elk. Okay. So, they feed on aspen, okay, which is a tree, but obviously they do not climb the trees, but they eat the young ones 
growing saplings. They also eat willow in uh, national parks. Okay. Willows growing by the side of the streams which they tend to stabilize the edges of the streams. Uh, so, we have a um, three level uh, chain. Okay. So, the uh, aspen and willow are autotrophs. They are fed upon by the herb herb herbivore and of course, the um, primary carnivore is grey wolf. So, a, a th typical three trophic level system where the grey wolf is feeding on the herbivores elk and elk is feeding on this. Then something happened. In the uh, uh, early to near late 1900s, grey wolves started disappearing from the Yellow National Park. Their numbers have come down uh, significantly and some places even disappeared. What happened? Well, the um, story is like this. Around the park, there are lots of villages and tending to their own domestic cattle, sheep and their own dogs, domesticated dogs, etcetera. And these wolves occasionally and later very frequently used to come into these um, inhabited areas, snatch away their wildlife animals such as um, domesticated many of them, sheep especially they are used to take. And it has become such a menace uh, for all of these villages that they decided to take the situation to their own control. They were equipped, they had pistols and uh, guns and other ammunition. They started shooting mercilessly these grey wolves and they even entered the periphery of the Yellowstone National Park and started shooting wherever they could see these things, shoot on sight. It is also said that the Yellowstone National Park authorities also collaborated because they felt that uh, some amount of uh, elimination is necessary to keep the ecosystem intact. So, that is how this was eliminated. Now, so which means now in the three ecosystem level, the top predator has been removed anthropogenically. What were the consequences? Okay. Uh, the elimination led to obviously increase in elk populations because that was their food and now the elks were relieved of a, a predator. So, started growing in enormous numbers. Their increase meant a disaster for the plants, the aspen and the willows. They started suffering and uh, a lot of places the park has become denuded. There was no aspen growing, there was no willow growing. There are many other consequences that the park suffered because when the willow was not growing or removed, the stream edges there was a lot of erosion and the very course of the stream changed. Now, this happened for a long time that finally, it dawned on the authorities, park authorities that we have to do something about it. They finally resorted to what is called an ecological restoration. Ecological restoration is a very, very important field of ecology now, where we are trying to restore some denuded uh, degraded ecosystems uh, like bringing back uh, denuded forests or mined areas. So, here the restoration simply meant uh, undoing the faults that uh, people have done which is introducing reintroducing the predator the grey wolves. So, they experimentally introduced a, a small uh, population of grey wolves into the system and uh, gradually the uh, population of these grey wolves has increased and bringing down some of these effects in a cascading way. But the situation now, uh, this is going on now, it is not as simple as that. There were some complications uh, caused mostly by some other inhabitants in the park which is one of them is of course, grizzly bear. Uh, the nightmarish bear for many uh, visitors to the park and bison. Um, these two sort of are competing with the same resources uh, as the grey wolves and elk. 
So, this story becomes a little complicated, but by and large what this episode that I have talked about illustrates the fact the importance of uh, predators in the ecosystem, what uh, they have been role they have been playing. When man or uh, humans uh, sorry replace or uh, remove the predator uh, from the ecosystem, you have seen the cascading consequences there, there ok. Alright, so I will go on to the um, third episode or case history. Here is an interesting case where uh, the trophy cascade concept has been applied with some beneficial effects. All right. That is a uh, um, uh, air, sorry aerial view of uh, um, Brazilian wetlands that I have taken from the plane. Uh, what looks like a thick green carpet all over is a profusion of growth of uh, cyanobacteria mostly microcystis. They form thick mats, they grow enormous abundance. Why do they do that? Because of excessive overloading of nutrients. As you know, the plants require phosphates and nitrates and the discharges into this uh, ecosystem, the wetlands uh, results in uh, overloading of nutrients and that results in the growth. This is not something unique to Brazil, uh, you see this is in UK, that is here in uh, Dal Lake Kashmir near her home and many of you are familiar with this, uh, the most uh, uh, important uh, tourist uh, attraction when you go to Srinagar, but uh, it is periodically subjected to this heavy pollution uh, presumably due to untreated or partially treated domestic effluents and sewage released into the lake uh, through boat houses and uh, other things. Okay. So, but this uh, problem I am going to discuss is in reference to Netherlands. Uh, there were this problem of algal blooms and water quality got uh, spoiled. Netherlands is a small country where uh, the whole country is connected by a network of canals. In fact, uh, I found that one could travel from one city to another city, not necessarily just going from one street to another street for shopping, but another city complete with your own boat. You have your own boat, you do not have to take a car. This is one of these canals that you see here. Okay. Now, this uh, canals and shallow lakes uh, there is a problem of uh, heavy loading of nutrients and hence thick algal growth everywhere. So, they used um, bio manipulation uh, which is actually using biological methods to reduce the pollution levels, aquatic pollution levels and increase the quality of the water. Uh, in this bio manipulation the scientists sort of applied the trophic cascade concept. All right. So, we have seen in the last two examples what trophic cascade is, some bio manipulation is required. So, now basically the canals and shallow lakes had three trophic levels like in the uh, first example I have quoted the phytoplankton. Okay. These are the types of algae, the different types of algae including cyanobacteria these are the ones that give that green color that you have seen in the Brazilian uh, photograph. These are fed upon by zooplankton. I do not know how many of you are familiar with zooplankton, but that has been our bread and butter during our research career. Uh, we did extensively work on this zooplankton. The zooplankton are tiny uh, microscopic organisms that you find in any water around the world, fresh water and they feed on the phytoplankton. Okay. So, well now who feeds on the zooplankton fishes of course, they are called planktivorous fishes like carp, planktivorous means simply plankton eating fish. So, you have three levels, the carp planktivorous fish feeding on zooplankton and zooplankton feeding on phytoplankton. Now, because of excess, excess nutrients 
you have this problem of uh, uh, algal, thick algal growth and leading to a deterioration of the quality of the water which the uh, authorities did not want. So, they decided to apply the trophic cascade concept. Okay. How does it do? Okay. Now, they thought suppose we introduce a, another trophic level to control the carps. So, they hit upon um, oh, before we go there I just wanted to show you zooplankton um, with which we had been working during the prime of my research career um, for more than 20, 25 years. These are the creatures most fascinating creatures uh, microscopic ranging from about uh, 40 micrometers to about uh, 500 micrometers translucent um, very fascinating if you observe under a microscope. So, with the three trophic level system they introduced a fourth trophic level which is the predatory pike it is a secondary carnivore. Now, it feeds on the planktivorous carps. So, experimentally into some canals and shallow lakes they have introduced this predatory pike. Now, what used to be a three trophic level system has now become four trophic level system with an autotrophs, herbivores, primary carnivores and secondary carnivores. Right? Okay. Now, what happened? The consequence of a cascade story is this. Oh, so, you have four levels the piscivorous fish which is the pikes feeding on the planktivorous fish carps, zooplankton and phytoplankton. So, you added these piscivorous fish pike when they keep increasing they keep feeding on the planktivorous fish uh, their numbers go down. So, there is a decrease in planktivorous fish because of the introduction of piscivorous fish that leads to an increase in zooplankton obviously, because there are not too many planktivorous fish to feed on them. So, they are increasing. Now, what do they do this zooplankton in huge numbers because they are free from predation by planktivorous fish they start feeding on this phytoplankton which leads to a decrease in phytoplankton, because they eat away a lot of phytoplankton that is produced there that leads to the desired goal which is improvement of water quality. Now, we do not see so many algae uh, which means now they do not smell as foul the dissolved oxygen concentration increases pH comes to normal levels BOD levels are tolerable and all that you know. So, this introduction of uh, a top piscivorous predator into the system had the cascading effect all the way down to phytoplankton and then improvement of the water quality since the control came from top these are called top down controls right top down controls. Now, whenever we mention top down the obvious uh, idea comes are there any bottom up controls also right. Okay, yes there are suppose you add nutrients into a system well especially into a system aquatic system where there are not, not too many nutrients such a, such a system is called oligotrophic okay, as opposed to neutrophic. So, this means now we have added nutrients we started this cascading effect now because of excess nutrients the phytoplankton starts growing right it is going up now the arrow and that most of the time because of the excess nutrients it results in cyanobacteria which are undesirable and that leads to a decline in water quality. Why are the cyanobacteria undesirable? Because they are many of them uh, are not easily digested many of them produce toxins. So, these are bottom up controls because we started the cascading effects from the bottom with the addition of nutrients that is the story of how the water authorities in Netherlands used both top down and bottom up controls as a supplementary measure I am not saying it is the exclusive measure by which they have achieved the desired goals. Besides the chemical physical methods they use this method bio manipulation uh, to augment uh, the efforts to bring about a clarity in the water and so the canals and uh, lakes ecosystems uh, improve. Okay. All right, so we we sort of looked at three examples, where in all those cases there is a, a predator. 
So, in every case you have understood and realized that they play a very very important role. So, how do we know that they are playing an important role and how do you test it? Now, I see you can always have hypothesis, but you should provide some kind of a proof either circumstantial evidence or an experimental proof. One way to do it is exclude or remove the top predator. Okay. Now, where they are present? This means now if the system has um, a predators, see if you can experimentally remove it and see what happens all the consequences. Do you find this cascading effects? Where did we see the situation when we removed this top predator? In the Yellowstone Park case history, where the predator has been removed by humans by shooting them down and decimating them. So, that is an experiment sort of they have done to show that there are cascading effects. The other way you can test of course, is introduce a predator where they are not present. There might be lot of ecosystems where there are no top predators. You introduce one and see what happens and this is precisely what they did in the case of uh, Netherlands water quality improvement. There was no top predator. So, they introduced a pike as a top predator and you could follow the consequences. So, at least these three cases now give the idea that predators play a very, very important role in nature. We do not realize that, but when you try to remove it, uh, you will suddenly see what the effects are. Um, see, um, many anthropogenic activities are leading to large apex uh, consumers in nature. How are we removing these predators? That is called trophic downgrading. Okay. Um, that means now <coughs> somehow we are re removing or excluding top predators from the natural ecosystems. How does one do that? Well, um, for instance, it keeps jumping. Um, we could be uh, many of them uh, have been hunting. Uh, okay. Uh, this uh, first port. It has been there uh, since our mythological times when the kings used to go for sport hunting. Uh, it was, was during there the Mughal period also. Did you know that um, there used to be a huge lion population between Delhi and Agra? And many of the Mughal rulers used to go on sports hunting and uh, they used to be at bring trophies of their uh, heads to show off uh, how wonderful they are. That a barbarous kind of situation. It is now banned, but still in many South African countries, um, African countries, this is still allowed uh, in the name of um, um, earn revenue or they even kill now these days elephants it seems uh, to get their meat to feed starving millions of people in their country. That is unbelievable, but it is true. So, uh, sports hunting they, and they, we are also removing the lots of predators by simply polluting the environment in which they live we, by encroaching into their habitats. We have deforested many areas where the tigers and other big predators find their home. We have removed them and we get upset when they encroach into our areas because they lost their habitat like the elephant man conflict in many areas. And unfortunately, we start shooting them down or they die in railway accidents, elephants. So, with without your knowledge, very often many of these predators are become um, brought down, their numbers are being down, and this is ecologist warned is not a safe thing for the health of the ecosystem. So, um, this is called trophic downgrading, that means gradual removal of apex predator from a natural ecosystem is called trophic downgrading. And uh, there is a paper uh, where they have warned that this downgrading trophic downgrading will have far reaching effects on carbon sequestration. Okay. That means, now the ability of the ecosystem to put away excess carbon and save the atmosphere from uh, warming temperatures. Two, it prevents invasive species when you remove the predators 
uh, invasive finds it very easy to get into the ecosystem. The, it, it reduces biodiversity. So, when you remove the predators, it encourages um, drop of biodiversity and it also helps in biogeochemical cycling. So, uh, in this short talk, I have uh, avoided any theoretical considerations, um, not any ecological models and all those things, because uh, considering the, uh, the listeners in mind, the target audience, I kept it as a, a descriptive, very interesting thing. And I published this uh, paper on these trophic cascades in resonance in November 2018. It is freely available to download, uh, and which I have described these three episodes and many more equations and theoretical models and all those things. Uh, I hope you can go through this. But the take home lesson finally is guys, is um, you do not tinker with nature without knowing or anticipating the consequences of what you are doing. We have seen many examples, there are only three, but there are dozens and dozens of uh, examples where we remove something um, naturally removed or anthropogenically removed and leads to a big cascade of problems. So, that is the take home message, the importance of predators in nature. Okay. So, with this I conclude and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot Professor Rav. Uh, uh, I will take the questions uh, sure, sure. Uh, one by one. My I pleasure. have received good number of questions. Maybe trivial, maybe difficult, but anyway, all questions are important for all of us. Yes, sir. Um, uh, can I start with a small symbol? Yeah. Uh, uh, I remember that you were talking uh, a while ago about uh, that why elephants are elephants, why ants are ants. So, one gentleman has asked the question, why do life forms look like the way we do? Uh, life is elephant, elephant kyun hai? I mean, I am extending this question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, why then elephant looks like the elephant, or why why an elephant could not like like a wolf or so? Right. Then it will be called wolf. <laughs> <laughs> as simple as that. But uh, but see, but there has to be some ecological reason. No. Yes, it's, it's, see, it's when the during the evolution of uh, all the diversity on this planet Earth, which took over more than three, almost two and a half billion years. Okay. Yes. Now, there were different kinds of niches to be occupied. If everybody was like an elephant, if everybody was like a tiger, there will be a big competition for resources. So, you have to diversify in various aspects in the during course of evolution in your body morphology, in your behavior, in your anatomy and physiology and all these things. And with the ultimate result is different species have acquired different forms to suit the habitat in which they live. Elephant is for instance suited to live in forests where you extending his proboscis, it can catch uh, leaves and branches. And a, yes. a tiger is very agile, cheetah is very agile, it can uh, run and to chase and a kill prey. Others. prey. Yes, kill so, the everything is adopted and there is no small niche that is not occupied some animal or other. You took the point, you took the point sir. So, there, there you have got my viewers, you have got the answer of another question which I received that why are there diverse organisms? This you have already also yeah, answered yeah. in the way. Uh, but in one of the slides when we were talking about the Netherlands experiment and in the lakes. So, num number one that uh, uh, can it be done in the flowing water, lakes are the still water? Yeah. Can it can the similar no. type of experiment has been repeated somewhere in mm, flowing? Mm. You see, in India things are very difficult to do such an experimental thing. The reason is nothing is nothing, nothing is under the control of the investigators. Some time ago we tried to do some research putting some enclosures in the Yamuna River backwaters. You know what happened? Next day we came, somebody dismantled and took some useful materials away. So, now uh, if you want to yes. do an experiment, uh, how do you control the situation? It is very difficult, very difficult to uh, accommodate. For instance, in the US, they have experimental lakes exclusively meant for research, two lakes where they can do all kinds of research. 
Where yes. will you get a situation like this in India? No, no way. Oh, no, here in India too, no, so situations, I, I have a reason to smile, sir. Uh, to, smile. I have a reason to smile too. I want to see, see that reason Yes, yes I, I will tell you, I will tell you, <laughs> sir. So, uh, look at the uh, lake in the Indore, uh, around which uh, we have a center for advanced technology, which is now known as Raja Ramanna Center for Advanced Technology. Uh -huh. uh, so, that is besides a lake, where we did some experiments to understand how the water lake is, dynamics. Uh, how the lake dynamics, not only the lake dynamics, I am a physics student, so I was interested in performing an experiment to understand the hydrostatics uh, yeah. behaviors that how the sound is generated in water and how it travels in the sound, if it is excited through lizards, etc. So, uh, I am hopeful uh, that way. No, uh, hey, these kinds of research are very important, very important. Many, many marine animals communicate uh, with other uh, creatures through sound production, right? Or yes. Even yes, songs sir. are messages. Yes, sir. Yeah, they have. A physicist is interested to see how the sound transmits in sea water versus fresh water, yes. etc. You know. Yeah, different densities. Yeah. You started with this. You started the session with this that how the bird is singing and yeah. why it is yeah. why is it singing. Yeah. But I, I tell my students, look, this is the way you have to look at nature. Just don't simply observe and say, hey, I have seen ten plants and all these things. Your curiosity must be aroused. You say when you, okay, you see, for instance, I quote simple examples, the um, bitter gold, why is it bitter? Why is simple it question, bitter? Yes, why is it why bitter? It is bitter yes. Do you have an answer for that? So many flowers that bloom at night are white. Do you have an answer why? Why shouldn't it be yellow, red and all those things? We physicists end up with understanding the answer of how. We very rarely go for understanding why. Maybe Where? it's not your premises, yes. but at least the ecologists should be asking why type of questions. Yes. They are more difficult to answer. They are much more difficult. More difficult they are much more because difficult. in the course of evolutions, lot of these things happened and if you want to test, you need that kind of a time. Now, suppose I propose that uh, this is because um, this character was acquired as a defense system against some enemy. Yes. Can you do this experiment now? And yes. Experiment takes about 10,000 years to get this kind of a behavior. Yes, it takes it. This is how you say anthropology. Where is your time? So, Jebra. <laughs> so, Jebra. Jebra has got its stripes as a camouflage. Yeah. 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 Camouflage. So, now you will simply say the maximum amount of time in an Indian university is the time a PhD student takes to get his degree. That is 3 to 4 this years. Okay. That is all yes. his research yes. is limited yes. to that now. Long term research is really missing yes. in India. Sir, can you come quickly come to slide number 46, where you were oh, showing the Brazil so. green plantain, okay. uh, to, that was case 3. Uh -huh. uh, uh, here you have shown the green carpet. Okay. Green carpet in slide number 46, sir, uh, it will come. Uh, yeah, uh. yeah, yeah, it is. So, this is a beautiful green carpet. Uh, it seems that as if the water is standing here, yeah. it is something like a lake, though it is a sea. No, it is a wetlands. It is a wetland, okay. okay. From the river. Back okay, wetland, wetlands. Uh, wetlands. But often we see in a particular season, uh, some rivers take a different kind of color, say pink. Oh, yeah, right. Say pink, some yeah, Even some red. lakes, you know, because yeah, this is a composition differs depending upon the types of algae, some of them are bacteria, uh, thick growths, and they, they at a, a acquire different colors, mm. but the most predominant is the cyanobacterial ones. And so, this, this is, is it, is it pure optical in nature or is it uh, the pigments, it is pigments the kind of come, pigments they have. But when we take the water in our hand, uh, it does not appear to have color. No, that is because you do not take enough of them. Oh, I see. Enough of them. Enough you see, for instance, now there are certain uh, marine algae that glow, uh, bioluminescence, uh, okay. Yes. Now, sometimes, uh, you, uh, when you go around, you know, this you get this beautiful luminescence, uh, beautiful like, luminescence. Uh, uh, like yes, blue, uh, yes. blue lights everywhere. Yes, I remember having seen in, uh, the, in the, at the Agati, yeah. uh, Lakshadip, yeah. uh, at Agati, we yeah. see uh, probably Agati see. and that uh, 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 another uh, island 12 kilometer, 12 nautical miles away from Agati, yeah. uh, beautiful island. Yeah. Uh, there we see. Uh, this yeah. kind of system, and when, luminescence, when they come in, so, because that the waves, you know, they are so kind of stimulant for them, and again they start glowing. Yeah. And somebody commented uh, earlier that when they are so abundant that you take in a just a bucket of water, that water, yes, it yes. will have more of these uh, organisms than the people of London. Oh. 
the whole public yes of yes that's true that, that's, that's true that's that's, 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 that's you are, you also have some questions some i, I have many a long list of questions but <laughs> unfortunately so we are running short of time i am not running out of time <laughs> you can take one if but you want. i just want to take one sir because uh, you said the tone you made us understand about ecology and everything and how human encroachment on the other activities have disturbed the ecosystem so your valuable message sir to a layman like me like what we can do you know in our surroundings to restore that ecological balance well, a bit. the most uh, <coughs> frequently used slogan is this okay think global act local okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> think global and right. act local okay yes. so you think about the global problems because suppose now you are talking about air pollution mm. global warming and all those things you alone cannot do anything absolutely the governments have to do they have to regulate the, the release of carbon amounts into the atmosphere and they mm. have paris agreements and all those things are there at an individual level you can't do anything but sir i can use more of public transport i right. guess right <laughs> so when at the individual level, what you can do is to see how to reduce the carbon emissions, carbon emissions. by choosing absolutely uh, vehicles or appropriate transportation that does not release so much Yes. Sir, one one question. So one, we one, can go on bicycles. Sir, one question, uh, which is very useful for the scientific community. Sure. Sir, you started that uh, with a famous quote that something is uh, if the bird flutters in Brazil, its effect is seen in Texas. Anthropology, uh, I mean uh, uh, the whole ecology is a study of seeing the effect which is taking place at one place at some other place. It's very. Have, uh, have we uh, uh, across this globe? have we done some study to see the effects what we are doing here or effects of what we are doing on other planets or another solar systems or another solar system we, we have to extend this concept yet to other planets because we have absolutely no idea where life exists and what kind of life exists uh, but the but these ecological effects could be on non life as well no but the thing is we have for instance suppose there is a planet okay earth like planet with all kinds of atmosphere they have we have no guarantee that the same kind of plants are growing there mm. so what kind of ecology can you do without knowing right. physics they can do it because the laws their laws are universal whether you exist here in the andromeda galaxy or the whole spiral galaxy but biology there are variations so True. we don't know what supports we have no idea whether it's the same dna is there in the creatures that yes, in the yes 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 i remember what professor speculations Rao. yes professor rao i remember one child asked me a question long ago a swedish child asked me a question that uh, on what basis do you say that life exists only on the planet earth it took me a couple of years in answering that that the kind of life which we understand on this planet is dependent on a wonderful molecule called h2o but there might exist some other kind of life which might be dependent, dependent on some, some other molecule some, exactly. some other molecule thank Fish. you very much sir okay. uh, my pleasure uh, bada maza uh, aaya exactly aur uh, aapko bar bar sunenge aur uh, bada acha laga my pleasure sir uh, we can have another session with you sir because some, some my question is still pending yes, but sir. maybe next time mine too. because okay. we are running short of time now but thank you so much for your valuable contribution no, actually uh, it's my pleasure uh, that you have invited me and yes, uh, i was so excited about to share the my passion for ecology you know the, i would uh, almost call in hindi expression junoon you know kind of thing junoon hai sir jugnu ka junoon hai so for my ecology yes, sir, yes. and i try to transmit this like an infectious disease i try to spread this to others you know Please. yes sir yes sir yes. like anyway you, you have done you have done today you have done today sir i hope so yes sir you have done it today <laughs> Uh, so so yes, that was our session for today. Butterfly effects, trophic cascades, natural and anthropogenic, and of course we are having another very important session. Uh, you know, so if you would you like to tell about the session that we are going to have, uh, uh, probably next Friday or maybe next. Friend, uh, friends, uh, a few months ago we had uh, Professor H S Komalesha from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, uh, in this show, and few uh, few months ago. he made a point that gagan you have not yet made any session dedicated to understand the art of listening lovely <laughs> the art of listening no the a title of our series is listening to learn so friends uh, on this assertion of my friend komlesha we are going to have another session uh, with komlesha on friday october 18th hmm. same time 10 o'clock on tuning in leveling up the art and craft of listening is basically art of listening so looking forward meeting you again on Absolutely. 18th of october 
Namaskar. Absolutely. And that Bye. was the session for today. So I thank uh, both my guests once again for their contribution to the session. And now it's time for me to wrap up this session over here. But uh, let me apprise you with all the programs that are coming ahead in today's uh, schedule. So at 12, you can have our program on teaching learning interventions where we'll be talking about Heron's formula under mathematics. Then at 2 p.m., we will have science session uh, with force and laws of motion. Again, uh, at 2.30, we'll talk about English. The chapter will be Kathmandu and then at uh, 3 we will have mathematics of course area related to circles and of course after that something on economics that is different sectors of the economy followed by uh, online training session and simultaneously you can also watch our uh, session Manu Darpan Paricharcha. At 5 we will be having Sahyog and at 5.30 we will bring you a session by school leadership development. So that's all from my side today. This is me Harpreet Kaur taking leave of you. But before I go, you can watch all our important relevant sessions of DESM on our website which is ncert.nic.in slash webinar underscore series dot php. That's all from now. Namaskar. <laughs>